One, two, three, four. In the sleeping hills of western New York, where the winters can be brutal and the roads can be treacherous, live some of the most remarkable people in the world. Each week, we'll showcase one of these incredible characters, right here on Outstanding Artists and Human Beings of Allegheny County. In this episode, we will be meeting Peter Roberts of Alfred, New York. He is the president of Spherical Block, LLC. Peter is the author of 14 U.S. patents with other patents pending both in the U.S. and internationally. Peter's work and the patents on new masonry designs should make our lives safer, our buildings and homes more affordable, energy efficient, more tornado and hurricane proof, and sustainable for a much longer time period than current construction methods. To quote Pete, innovation in masonry is critical to meet growing challenges facing our world. These advancements I propose will create new markets, foster economic growth, create revolutionary new green construction technology that will build safe, beautiful, affordable buildings that I believe can withstand high winds and severe weather events better than wood frame structures. We had a wonderful time getting to know Peter over the course of a year and a half and are incredibly inspired by him and his work. We are really excited to share his story with you. Autumn! Hi, Pete! It's so nice to meet you. Oh, I'm so thrilled to meet you and I'm really eager to see what you've got going on here. Great, well, we'll take a look here in just a minute. Awesome. We have just watched some scenes of devastating weather events that have caused immense destruction to homes, businesses, and loss of lives. And I just wanted to say that it is really inspiring to meet someone who is working to create useful and actionable solutions to the catastrophic climate challenges that we are facing. So thank you. Yes, that's a big part of what my company is trying to tackle, and I will explain that in just a minute here. Awesome. Wow. This, this is incredible. How high are these ceilings? This is up about 30 feet tall, and I guess that's why you hire a good architect. This was all his idea, and he designed um, these three windows originally. While I was building this, the tragedy of the fire at Notre Dame happened. I've always loved Notre Dame, so I put in a kind of a, a tribute to the rose window up on mm. top there, that round window. But yeah, it does make for kind of a dramatic entrance. It's an incredible yeah. entrance. Okay, well, let's walk in. Let me show you this living room, which I've kind of finished off here. Wow. Yeah, so this is made of a series of independent arches made from the arch block. They have three pieces of rebar inside of each one. Uh, this is a, a catenary, which I'll describe to you in a minute. And the arches on the end, they go, the, the, the arch goes all the way down to the ground on the outside. So basically, it's like a hanging chain that's flipped right side up. And that's what stabilizes the building. It makes yes, it, that gives it a lot of strength. A lot of longevity. And then in the center here, uh, behind this wooden covering, there's a, a concrete beam just to um, give strength between the arches so they can't move either way. Mm. So it makes for a very strong configuration. and Simple and pretty easy to assemble. This is stunning. It's like being in a cathedral. It is kind of neat, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How long did it take you to build this space? Uh, the, the masonry construction was done in a summer. Okay. And then the past two years, I just finishing off by myself because of COVID. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But a crew could finish this off just like conventional construction a few weeks. Nice. Pete, how did you get started with this type of masonry work? Well, it's, there are a, a couple of things, Autumn. When I was a, a child, we lived in Europe mm. for a year. My father taught European history. And I was dragged into all the great cathedrals of Europe. That so sounds I, rough. <laughs> <laughs> but That's I was amazing. always fascinated walking into these places and seeing these beautiful masonry arches. Mm -hmm. So that had a huge impact on me as, as a child. And then... Later, as an adult, I did pottery, and I decided to do giant pots, mm. and they became very architectural. So that led to the idea of maybe doing ceramic houses, which in turn led to masonry. And I looked at what's the most <clears throat> prevalent form of masonry, and that's concrete block. Mm. 
So it had never been done, and I'm actually the first person or company or organization to use concrete block to make roofs as arches and domes. So I'm unique in the world that way. Where did you learn these techniques? I went to school here in Alfred, New York, to Alfred University's New York State College of Ceramics, and I kind of did both engineering and art, and I combined those and got a custom degree in masonry science. So I studied under some of the great scientists and all the great artists. No, oh, that's, a, that's a great marriage. Yeah, it really two. is. Yeah. It's very productive. Mm -hmm. yeah. How long have you been working on these projects? I've been at this for about 35 years now. I began this as an undergraduate student and have been at it pretty much since then. So it's been a continuous process of self-education mm -hmm. and development, and I just love it. And how long have you been working on the project here on this property? Uh, this building was started uh, just around three years ago. Mm -hmm. Oh, you've accomplished a lot in the last three years. Yes, I have. And you know, the past two years, I've been working completely alone because of COVID. Mm -hmm. So that was its own challenge, but yeah. I'm up to it. So, wow. Yeah. Can you go into some detail of how your masonry systems can help protect us from hurricanes, tornadoes, wildfires? Sure. Um, for one thing, concrete is just inherently a strong material. It's very strong under compression, being mm -hmm. squeezed together. And when I was describing a catenary form, the entire structure is under compression, which is how concrete is strong. Mm. Well, Robert Hooke uh, originally discovered um, the concept of a catenary, which is from the Latin word catena, which means chain. So if you hang a chain with some slack in it, the shape of that hanging chain is a catenary. And if you turn that upside down or right side up in the case of an arch, then you have a catenary arch. And that is the strongest possible shape for a masonry arch. Now in terms of a fire, um, the, the fire safety rating is done over time. In other words, how long can a building withstand temperatures of like 2,000 degrees? And right now the magic number is about two and a half hours for a building to be considered safe and have a good fire safety rating. I'm convinced based on the research I've done and the knowledge I have that we could probably achieve something like a five hour safety rating. Wow. Yeah, it'd be a real game changer and it's affordable. Yeah. Amazing how inexpensive this is. Now, another interesting aspect is um, manufactured concrete block. The block are squeezed together when they're made. And that axis is the high strength axis of the block. So if you consider a vertical wall, that high strength axis is always vertical. That means that the weak axis is horizontal. So if it's impacted from the side, conventional concrete block, you're hitting the weak side and you can poke a hole through it if you're in a tornado or something. Mm -hmm. And with my block, we always have that high strength axis oriented radially to the outside. So it's 70% stronger, almost twice as strong, just by changing the orientation of the block so that we have that high strength axis facing out. Is that um, a technique that's been used before or I'm, is this something I'm, you figured out? On this, your this is something I figured out myself. I actually had a, a student do his thesis on measuring anisotropy and doing an optical analysis of the aggregate within the grain and he did strength testing among different axes and everything. Mm -hmm. So I am proud to say that I'm the originator of this application. That is incredible. Can you talk to me a little bit about the cost difference between traditional modern building practices and what you have going on here with these masonry designs? Yes, absolutely. The, our, our cost of building a masonry envelope, that's just the materials, and it, and it describes the, the masonry component, the walls and the roof of the building. Um, we come in at um, as little as $10 per square foot. Um, on a more elaborate building, it might be up to $20 per square foot. Okay. But by comparison, your typical wood frame construction with you know stud balloon frame construction, they call it, um, might be 100 to 150 to $200 per square foot. Wow. And we provide a much better building at a lower cost. It's an amazing value provided by 
the high efficiency of the concrete block industry. We've been making concrete block in this country for around 120 years, and it's developed in such a high state of efficiency. That translates into tight dimensional tolerances, very high strength, and a beautiful finish with colors possible. So um, concrete block makes this uh, affordable and better. I'd also love for you to talk a little bit about the energy efficiency of these buildings. Sure, now the, the energy efficiency is really largely due to the thermal mass benefits imparted by concrete. Um, that refers to the ability of the material to store heat and then to kind of re-release that heat back to the inside. And it, it makes, takes less energy to, to keep a building warm mm -hmm. and also to keep a building cool during, during hot weather. Um, there's a, a lag between you know, when the, it, the sun rises in the, in the day and the, the heat goes up, and at some point at the height of the day when things are hottest, everyone turns on their air conditioner. Now, in a masonry building, there's a time lag. It takes time for that heat to penetrate through the walls and roof of the building and actually heat up the inside. And what that means is that your air conditioning is going to be required in a masonry building later on in the day. And so that reduces the peak load requirements of the mm. grid. So it's a huge deal. And any electric grid is defined by its peak load requirements. So if we can reduce that peak load by creating a lag and when the electricity is needed, then it, it saves the whole grid. So that, that's a really big deal. And masonry does that. It's well known. And that, that increase in efficiency is around 30%. So it's significant. That's huge. Yeah. Yeah. It's also most effective where you have a, a big temperature swing during the day. In other words, if it gets cold at night and then hot during the day, mm -hmm. a masonry envelope will have the maximum benefit in that case. I should also add that the, the efficiency increase is greater in hot temperatures. That's increasingly important due to global warming. We're going to be looking at a lot more hot temperatures in the future. So the benefits of, of masonry construction are particularly apt for global warming. I've heard you've received various grants from the National Science Foundation to test your ideas and complete your work. Can you tell me a little bit about those? Sure, yes. I um, applied for and received both a phase one and a phase two and several supplementary grants to uh, demonstrate my masonry technology. And the most important main objective was to obtain uh, product listings and an evaluation from the International Code Council Evaluation Services, which writes the International Building Code. It's very important to be compliant with the building code if you're introducing a new building technology. Mm -hmm. And I was able to do that through my work funded by the National Science Foundation. Congratulations. Oh, thanks. That's exciting. That was a game changer. The NSF is a wonderful organization. Mm -hmm. So if, if the rest of our government were, were run like the National Science Foundation, we'd be a better country. Mm -hmm. How much funding did you receive, if you don't mind me asking? I received somewhere between one and two million dollars from the National Science Foundation. Kind of hard for me to remember because there's so many sub awards, mm -hmm. but maybe a, around a million and a half. That's awesome. Yeah. Did you start this project before they gave you funding? Yes, I did. I actually put about $130,000 of my own money to start the company, and that allowed me to show enough that I was, in fact, able to obtain the funding from the National Science Foundation. What did the $130,000 start to build? Uh, that allowed me to file a patent, to yep. have molds made, to get block produced, and to make my first building. Cool. And it I get paid a big, off. I get a big bang for the buck. Yeah. Most people couldn't come close to that on $130,000. That's part of the beauty of this area. There's a lower cost of living and a lower cost of doing business. Mm -hmm. It's a good place to do business. Nice. What would you say the National Science Foundation's purpose and hope in awarding you the money is? They like to see what they call a societal benefit. Hmm. And this technology provides many societal benefits. One is affordable housing, safe housing, environmentally appropriate housing, and housing that can withstand extreme weather events such as tornadoes, hurricanes, wildfires, earthquakes, and so on. 
Also, um, that it's energy efficient. So it costs less money to heat and cool a building with a masonry building. Societal yeah. benefit. As yeah. yeah, amazing. Have your beliefs and practices been tested and or certified? And what is that process like? Yes, they have been tested and certified. Uh, it's a very lengthy and expensive process. I obtained two product listings and a positive evaluation report from the International Code Council Evaluation Services. And ICC writes both the International Building Code and the International uh, Residential Code. It's critical to have code compliance with a new technology. Uh, the testing was done by the laboratory at the National Concrete Masonry Association in Herndon, Virginia, where they strength tested my actual block. Hmm. Do they ever test the structures as well? Is there a way to do that? Uh, this whole building um, that was part of the ICCES evaluation. Okay. So I worked with a licensed professional engineer, Cheng Neng Zhang, who was also my patent attorney. Mm -hmm. So he was familiar with the technology. And then we have to work with an advanced architect known as a registered design professional. And my RDP was Robert Ferry. He's kind of a, a world famous architect. So the three of us together designed this building and showed our reasoning and our, our approach and our logic mm -hmm. and how it was designed, going back to catenary analysis and so forth. Um, so you, you show how you, the, the steps you take to design a building, and uh, then they evaluate it accordingly. So this actual building um, served for us to obtain the product listings and the positive evaluation report from ICC. Cool. Yeah. You've stated that your blocks have carbon reducing technology and could even be carbon negative in the next two years. Can you tell us about that? Sure. Um, all the block that you see here and the way they're made in, in accordance with the ICC specification, we use fly ash, which is a waste product from burning coal. Mm -hmm. So that means that you need less Portland cement. And when you create Portland cement, uh, when you heat it up, you give off a lot of CO2. Mm -hmm. And 8% of all the man-made CO2 in the atmosphere has come from producing Portland cement. Wow. It's a huge problem. If it were a country, it would be the third largest contributor after the U.S. and China of CO2 and the atmosphere. So there's this dire need to reduce carbon dioxide from Portland cement. Okay. And the other thing I'm doing, I'm working with a company called Brimstone, and they are uh, also funded by the National Science Foundation, a brand new company with brand new technology, and they have a way to, to make Portland cement, which is carbon neutral. A third thing I'm looking to do is to, there's a new technology using graphene, which is pure carbon. It's like a hexagonal lattice, uh, just one atom thick, and you add that in a tiny percentage to cement, and it greatly increases the strength of the cement. So that you can increase the strength of cement by like 30%, with um, a tenth of a percent addition of graphene. So by making it 30% stronger, that's 30% less cement you have to use. So we're looking at all these technologies together. Uh, pozzolanic fly ash, carbon neutral. Can you explain what pozzolanic fly ash is? Yeah, a fly ash is a waste product from burning coal. And uh, it comes from the Italian town of Puzzoli, so they call it pozzolanic. Mm -hmm. And that's like the Roman um, cement made from volcanic ash. So that's the original genesis of it, of the idea. And it, it's not a cement completely by itself, but in the presence of cement, it acts as a cement. So that means that you don't have to use as much Portland cement to make your concrete when you use fly ash. And where is the fly ash sourced from? Fly ash comes basically from utility companies that have burned coal over decades to create electricity. So it's a waste product. Yeah, it's a, it's a toxic waste product, and we're trying to put it to good use to help strengthen concrete. That's really fascinating. Yeah. Do you have other people in businesses that are working with you on this project? Yes, in addition to the employees that I've hired to help me with uh, some of the construction, I worked with Alfred University. They were a sub-awardee on some of my NSF funding, and I also work very closely with Southern Tier Concrete Products, that's a local Also company. based in Alfred, New York, right? That's right. And those guys sit on my board of directors. Mm -hmm. They're a great source of information. They're third and fourth generation block makers. So they know the industry quite intimately and quite well. So I'm, I'm fortunate to work with Ben and Pat Palmer. Mm -hmm. 
Nice. Uh, yeah, the father and son, owners, operators of Southern Chairs Concrete. Rhythm is my guide. Cause I need a go man. Make me feel good spin. Show me, show me all the places that are hard to find. How did you make the arches on the ceiling? Actually, I use these special blocks that I make, which have grooves in them, and you know, I have some outside. You want to check it out? Yeah. yeah. Well, let me show you. So Ari, you had asked me when we were inside how those arches are built. And before I get really into that, let me talk about this structure right here. This is a test building I'm making. It's just a one-car garage, but I'm doing it as a test of this block system that could be used to make very high strength seawalls to protect our coastal areas against hurricanes and sea level rising and so forth. Now, when a regular, when a concrete block is made, it gets compressed down in the machine. It's made very fast. It takes about one second to produce one of these blocks. Eight of them are made at a time is an eight second cycle time. So a block a second. When it pushes down, it all the aggregate get jostled around by vibration and they line themselves up at 90 degrees to that applied force. And what that means is that it's much stronger in this di direction of compaction as the block are made. So for example, when you're building a vertical wall like this, with regular concrete block, you always have that high strength axis vertically oriented. And what I do is I take and flip that high strength axis on its side horizontally. And if you think about a seawall, it's not subject to vertical stresses so much as it is lateral stresses from waves that hit it. So if we have the high strength axis running this way, it can handle the waves that'll slam into it by like 70% stronger. And that's significant. That's a lot. So the same block, the way they work, they are kind of wedge shaped. And here is a skinny corner and then down here is the fat corner. So it's wedged at a compound angle, 45 degrees to, to these faces. So here's the skinny corner and here's the fat corner. So if, if we're laying these down, and we can imagine here's our skinny corner and here's our fat corner. And we assemble these into what I call a flying V because it's a V shaped and it's a flying buttress. And we would put rebar into each of these three grooves here, okay? And then the next course would go on top of that first course, just like this, so that those grooves line up around the rebar and they really lock it into place. And then you'd obviously, you put a bed of mortar between these block. And we set the next block like that. And then we just continue this pattern, repeating as we started off. And again, this is the skinny corner here. Here's the fat corner back here. And it goes just like this, so that as these assemble, it starts to bevel in, and this will turn into an arch. And just dry stacked without any mortar, these will assemble into about a 30 foot arch. Pretty good size. Very high strength. So that's how it works. Cool. Yeah. All right. Isn't that really neat? Yeah. When I was a student at Alfred University, my roommate, Jennifer L. Knox, amazing woman, and <clears throat> we lost touch and then reconnected over the internet. And she asked me to write about poetry, a poem about masonry um, every day for the month of April, which is poetry month. So Napo Rimo, the National Poetry Writing Month. So I did that. And my poems were all, they're 
silly, trying to write a poem every day. <laughs> they were well received and encouraged. So I did it again, then I did it again, and I did it again. I did it for five years. So I have 150 really bad poems about masonry. So here are just a few of them. The first is a cleric here. It's a four line poem. And it's supposed to be funny, autobiographical or biographical. So here we go. Francis Straub from Pennsylvania in 1913 had his mania. He used cinders round the clock when he invented cinder block. <laughs> In your article in Masonry Magazine from 2020, you write about unique applications and uses for your particular block. Can you tell us about them? Sure. There are some, a lot of applications for this masonry system. Obviously, we can do residential, commercial buildings, big government buildings. We can also um, do a lot of public infrastructure. Hmm. We can make bridges, um, especially small and medium-sized bridges Currently, the country has a requirement to replace 30,000 um, small and medium-sized bridges. This technology is ideally suited for that. They're going to be affordable. Mm. They would last forever. Right now, the, the, uh, your basic concrete bridge in a place in a northern climate where they salt the roads might last about 50 years. And if you look at, for example, the Roman aqueducts, those beautiful masonry arches, those are 2,000 years old right. and still going strong. So we can do that. Are there any other unique uses that come to mind? Actually, there are quite a few. One of them is uh, to build extraterrestrial applications. That would include lunar bases or bases on the Mars or on an asteroid or any other planet because the cost of shipping material from the Earth on a rocket is kind of prohibitively expensive. Exorbitant, yeah. So if we can use the material that's there, um, we could use, you know, rocks and minerals found either on the moon or on Mars to, to produce block and, and assemble them to make a structure in situ, right on the spot. That's wild. Another application are, you know, because of the high compressive strength of concrete, we could actually make submarines out of concrete block. <laughs> trying to think. There. Picture that. <laughs> we can, it, yeah. If you can imagine that the strongest possible, um, concrete is strong under compression, being squeezed together. And there's a lot of pressure in At the, the deep At the bottom sea. of the ocean, there sure yeah. is. And the strongest shape is a sphere. We are spherical block. So we can produce a very high strength sphere out of concrete very affordably. And there are potential applications for that, for any underwater applications. mentioning something about coral regeneration within concrete yes. block if you were to use it in the seawall application? That's correct. We're trying to make uh, biophilic or life attracting concrete structures. Um, one thing we'll do is lower the pH. This is very basic, mm -hmm. um, basic uh, alkali. Um, mm -hmm. So we want to take the pH from around 13 and a half down to maybe 10 or so. A, a low pH is acidic. Mm -hmm. A pH of one is the most acid. A pH of 14 is the most alkali. Right. This is around 14. It's very alkali. So you have to take the pH down to make it less basic, less alkali, more neutral, mm -hmm, going towards mm -hmm. acidic, but not quite acidic yet. Yeah. Anyway, so that allows life to grow on it. <clears throat> and then another thing we can do, these blocks in particular have this joint where the rebar goes, this gap right here, and we can place a coral polyp right into there, like a seedling and use this as a backbone to start building, um, you know, a coral reef. So we're working with, you know, the Reef Ball Foundation, and we can also do this with domes, large uh, geodesic domes that are, they're usually cast as a monolithic, as one piece. But we can obviously use masonry components to, to build one, and the same principle of the high strength axis is always facing out, so that it's stronger that way. Mm -hmm. If it's hit by waves or anything, it's got all the strength facing the wave that hits it. So. Uh, and then we can have holes or ports in these hollow triangular block and that allows fish to come in and out. And it also will, if a wave breaks on it, it dissipates a lot of the wave energy, mm -hmm. it attenuates that wave. So that's mm -hmm. going to save your coast mm -hmm. from being directly hit by especially, you know, storm waves and a hurricane and so forth. That's incredible. Yeah. So many amazing applications. Yes, I think so. Well, I'm here for it. All right. That's <laughs> yeah. Great. Changing the world one one block at One a time. One block at a time. We're, we're right here. We can have a block party. Mm -hmm. Look at this. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
Pete, this is an incredible literary collection. Talk to me about all of these amazing books. Yeah, I just, uh, just built this bookshelf and put it up. Um, this has mainly my, my father's uh, book collection. Mm. He was a professor of European history uh, at the University at Albany. Um, he mainly studied the French Revolution through kind of art, literature, and music. So this had a huge effect on me um, growing up and, and my identity as an adult. And just to, to, to be aware and kind of conscious and cognizant of um, the Enlightenment mm. and the Age of Reason, pretty much from around 1685 to about 1830, there was just this explosion of knowledge in Western Europe, and it's formed so much of the world that we live in today. I believe in logic and reason, mm -hmm. as opposed to superstition and even religion and dogma. Um, I think that's one of the gifts of the Enlightenment. So, books are very important to me. Masonry is so optimistic because you're building for the future. You're building for centuries from now. And a lot of people don't think like that. And it's, I think it's important that we do plan, you know, and that's what the sustainability is all about. Um, Absolutely. So all this stuff is just, a, yeah, it's important. In that same article in Masonry Magazine, you mentioned that your company is eager to work with other engineers, architects, building firms, masons, block makers who are really eager to use this new technology. Can you share with us some of the goals for those collaborations? Yes, the goal is really to, to market penetration, to get mm -hmm. this technology out there and to provide better buildings for not just in the US, but globally. There is a global market for this. So our plan again is to attend the World of Concrete trade show yep. and you know, launch this commercially. And I expect that we will make block makers a lot of money. This is a very much gonna be a value added product mm -hmm. while still being very affordable and providing a better building at a lower cost for anyone in the market. This includes residential, commercial, government buildings, infrastructure, and so Submarines. On. Submarines even, all these applications. I expect that we're gonna create entirely new markets for block makers, for masons, for architects, designers, contractors. They'll be making things that have never been done before. So we'll, we'll create entirely new markets. That's really exciting. Yeah, it is. Peter, I would love to show everyone how unique and magnificent this building is. Do you mind if we take a little tour? Sure, let's take a look. It's very much under construction, but it'll allow you to see some of the process. Oh, that... So pardon the mess, but let's go take a look. Let's do it. All That's right. awesome. So what is this little room? This little room is just an anteroom between the kitchen the bedroom and the bathroom. You know, with this building, I had to demonstrate all the different features that we can make to the International Code Council. And one of those is this first frequency, kind of smallest dome. And a first frequency, that refers to what's known as a truncated icosahedron, which is basically a soccer ball type geometry, where the black patches on a soccer ball are pentagons with five sides, mm -hmm. and the white patches are hexagons with six sides. So we have two different masonry blocks, hex blocks, which six assemble into a hexagon, and pent blocks, five of which assemble into a pentagon. And a first frequency dome, if you take a triangle, um, you can divide that into four smaller triangles. Mm -hmm. So by using four times as many triangles, you make a structure that's twice as big. And then by using nine times as many triangles with the same breakdown, yeah. you can make a structure that's three times as big. So I show a first frequency, a second frequency, and a third frequency dome in this building. And this is a first frequency eight foot diameter dome. And then in the kitchen here, let's go into the kitchen. So here we are in the kitchen, and this is a second frequency truncated icosahedron, so it's twice as big as the anteroom. So this is 16 foot across, and you'll have to pardon our mess here, we have a film crew visiting. <laughs> <laughs> and it's obviously a work site. But um, again, we tried to fill this building with as many features as we could to 
to kind of show really all the things we can do mm -hmm. to the International Code Council. Mm -hmm. And for example, if you look up here, those exposed block are part of the master bedroom, which is a third frequency dome, mm -hmm. which is 24 feet across, so even yep. bigger. Cool. So why don't we, let's go take a look at that. So here we are, this is the master bedroom, and this is a third frequency truncated icosahedron. So this room is 24 foot in diameter, um, and you can see how it's obviously <laughs> under construction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but I really like the shapes. I mean, the shapes yeah, are incredible. Yeah, it, it is kind of beautiful, and, and you know, everything that I do is an experiment. So in this case, it's being covered with drywall, mm -hmm. just because I haven't done that before. Yeah. But we can also do, you know, the exposed block that you see here. Um, you can paint the block, you can parge coat, uh, apply plaster directly to the block. So everything is an experiment. In this case, I'm covering it with, with drywall. Mm -hmm. so but it'll there are be, lots of textural finishing options that's right. available. Mm -hmm. This will look just like the ceiling in, in the kitchen, which we were just oh, in, yeah. once it's finished. And then here again, you can see these blocks going through to, to the kitchen. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. And that, that was um, a, an idea of my architect, and I actually love it. It's kind of cool, letting, that is being cool. able to see from one room into the other like that. And when it is all covered in drywall, you'll still see those bit of block. So you'll see some of the bones yeah. inside the building. You know, yeah. you get to see, yeah. It'll make people of the future feel like they can feel the history of the building. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so you have been building this all yourself. Yes, I have. For, for, the, the, for the past for the, two years, finishing off the interior has been all me working alone. So yeah, I have to get up on these ladders. And even like the, the entryway, that tall entryway, to climb up with a piece of four foot by eight foot drywall by myself and hold it with one hand while you drill a hole. Yeah. And then you got to get the other driver and put it in. That first screw is tricky. I'm sure it uh, is. So, but I'm getting good at it. Um, yeah. Clearly, yeah. yeah so. Tell me about this room. Well, this is going to be the bathroom. And um, you might notice that the ceiling in here has this kind of a zigzag pattern, which mm -hmm. I refer to as a corrugated masonry roof. And that corrugation, just like corrugated cardboard, provides greater strength to a structure by imparting more flexural rigidity to it. And uh, the key to that, we have uh, pieces of rebar, and I actually use a special reinforcement bar um, known as FRP, or fiber reinforced polymer, here are two types. This one is a simple fiberglass rebar, very lightweight, kind of flexible, mm -hmm. very high strength. It's stronger than steel in tension as you pull it apart. That's amazing, stronger yeah, than steel. Yeah, that's incredible. And most importantly is that it never rusts. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, that's why our highways all fail, rusting rebar. Yeah. Now, this is another type of FRP rebar. And um, this is made from basalt or basalt. It's a mineral mm -hmm. that's melted down and then drawn into fibers and then glued together with this kind of polymer. And very lightweight, again, very high strength. And this is actually more resistant to chemical attack from like salt water than a fiberglass rebar. But they're, they both have their place and they're both wonderful and they're perfect for this kind of construction, mainly they bend so easily that it's very easy to assemble an arch, mm -hmm. a dome or an arched roof. And do they coexist together? They do. The, the basalt is uh, a little bit more expensive, mm -hmm. but this provides you, if you were going to build in a saltwater environment, I would recommend right. basalt. Um, here, around here, um, the fiberglass is just fine. Mm -hmm. And then in addition to the corrugated surface that we have in this bathroom roof, we can also do a smooth surface made from the same block. And let me show you that. That is adjacent to the bathroom. We have a wood-fired sauna here. And upstairs from the sauna is a changing room. And if you look up at the ceiling of that, you'll see that this is not corrugated. It's just a, a regular smooth oh, roof. Yeah. So now this is not as strong as a corrugated roof, but um, it's less expensive and faster to assemble. Um, and you don't really need a corrugated roof unless you're into a really large span. Mm -hmm. I don't need a corrugated roof for, for the bathroom, 
but it's such a, I, I was trying to show every feature yeah. that we can do for the International Code Council. So we're, that's why it's there. Pete, what would the dream outcome of your work be? I think the dream outcome would be to positively affect the planet and the people on this planet mm -hmm. um, to the greatest extent that, that we could. And uh, by that, I mean provide housing which is safe and affordable. It's fireproof. It's going to withstand hurricanes, tornadoes, mm -hmm. earthquakes, wildfires. And then also in the act of, of actually making um, this improved, you know, concrete construction system that we're using green technology. Mm -hmm. um, cement produces so much CO2 the way it's conventionally made. Yeah. And we're looking at innovations in materials to reduce the carbon footprint. And actually, not only reduce the carbon footprint, but produce cement that will absorb CO2 out mm -hmm. of the atmosphere. Yeah. Pete, how do you think we did today? I think we did all right, Autumn. I think so too. Yeah. Thank you so much for having us and for showing, around, showing us around this amazing place. Thank you place. so much for coming and for all of your work. I really appreciate it. Well, we really appreciate all of your incredible contributions to the future of masonry and Great. a sustainable world. Excellent. Cheers. Cheers. And we will see you next time on Outstanding Artists and Human Beings of Allegheny County. Mm -hmm.